Golden State Media Concepts bring you Book Review Podcast, a haven for bookworms of all ages and the widest genres from mystery to memoirs, romance to comedy, fantasy to sci-fi. If you love to read, this is the podcast for you. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Hello and welcome to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I am your host, Sarah. As always, delighted to be with you on another Tuesday, a dark and gloomy Tuesday here, but I am still happy because it means we might be getting some rain today. Um, I hope so. Hope that you had a wonderful Thanksgiving, if that is a holiday that you celebrate. We actually did have a Thanksgiving meal. It's you know, certainly not a holiday that they celebrate in Portugal, but we did have a Thanksgiving meal. We have some friends who live in a neighboring town who actually moved here the week before we did, um, and they moved from California, sort of close to where we moved from. Actually, Elizabeth was one of my authors a while back. Elizabeth Stanley was an author on the podcast, and she and I, and uh, well, she and her husband and me and my husband have become friends since we all moved here almost two years ago. So they invited us to their place for Thanksgiving dinner. It was five Americans, two people from England, one person from Scotland, and one person who was from England and Canada, kind of both. <laughs> Um, so we had, a, we had an international Thanksgiving, and it was relatively traditional. You know, you had all the, the fixings, turkey and stuffing, and do you call it stuffing or dressing? Uh, we had, I would say this was dressing because it wasn't actually stuffed in a turkey, so I consider stuffing something that comes out of a bird. Is that how you think of it? It's always interesting, but uh, lots of good food, and it was it was really nice just to celebrate a holiday in a sort of traditional way and and also in a very non-traditional way because you know you can't get the same ingredients here so everything was just a little bit different just slightly different and then you had people from other countries and cultures and it was a lot of fun so I'm glad that we got to do that I hope that you were able to spend time with people that you care about and uh, celebrate that day for giving thanks and being grateful for the blessings that we have been afforded in our lives I, of course, am thankful for you, my listeners, for this podcast and for all of the authors that I get to meet through this podcast. It has been a wonderful experience that has gone on far longer than I ever anticipated it to possibly go. We are now in, I don't know, what have I been doing this, six years? Seven years? I have to look and see, but... You know, 441 episodes later, and I need to go and count how many interviews that is, but hundreds of interviews, and it's just been amazing, so I'm very grateful for the experience. But let's talk about this week's author and this week's book. I'm speaking with Margaret Claw this week about her debut fiction novel. She has a nonfiction book that she's written, but this is her first fiction. It is called Every Other Weekend. It is a story told from multiple points of view about a couple going through a divorce and kind of a look at how that plays out in terms of perceptions and points of view and stories that are told and the perception of truth within those stories. Um, The description of the book is as follows. 40-ish hipster dad Jake is happily settled down in the politically progressive, urban, and notably self-satisfied community of Greenwood, working at his not-so-interesting job, playing guitar with his band, and enjoying domestic life with his beautiful and accomplished wife, Lisa, their two charming daughters, and the beloved family dog. When Lisa rocks Jake's world by telling him she wants a divorce, their story unfolds from multiple points of view, including those of other family members, Jake's self-absorbed divorce lawyer, the cranky family court judge who presides over his custody case, his polyamorous millennial girlfriend, and the 18-year-old babysitter who also happens to be his lawyer's daughter. Throughout Greenwood, in the coffee shop, the yoga studio, and the basketball court, lives intersect. Choruses of friends and neighbors gossip, dissect, and weigh in. 
A surprise witness upends Jake's custody trial. Things are not always as they seem, and there is no one truth about marriage. It's a really good description of this book and its multiple points of view and the differing, the different threads that are pulled together and just all the ways that we see things. A very small, close-knit community makes a difference because everyone knows everybody else's business, right? And so there's all of these different intersections that happen within the story and between the characters uh, because of that small community. So you get a lot of intersectionality within the characters and their stories and what is true and what do we perceive to be true and how are we saying what maybe we think is true or maybe we're trying to spin the story to make it seem the best possible from our point of view all kinds of different levels within this book so it's it's very interestingly told because you do have all of those voices including some that you're like okay I I didn't really think about why that is important or how that brought got brought in um so you hear from all four members of this family from um jake and lisa and their two daughters you hear from them but then like you heard the lawyer the uh judge who's presiding over the case the lawyer's 18 year old daughter the just the a lot a lot of different and then the choruses so these are these sort of intersecting chapters these between chapters where you just kind of hear what different groups in the community are gossiping about it's just very interestingly done so let's go ahead and let margaret talk about this book obviously she wrote it she can tell you more about it so again the book is called every other weekend the author is margaret claw hello margaret welcome to the podcast hi sarah nice to meet you Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. I'm happy to talk to you. Um, we're going to talk about your novel every other weekend. But before we get to the book itself, if you would take a moment just to introduce yourself so my listeners can get to know you a bit. Sure. Um, so my name is Margaret Claw, and I am primarily um, what I do is I'm a lawyer. Um, that's my certainly my day job. Um but it's uh, it's been my job for many years, and I practice family law, um, and which means divorce, custody, child support, adoption, um, prenuptial agreements, those types of things. And I have a small firm in Philadelphia. We're an all women firm, and um, but I've always been interested in writing. And until my youngest child left home for college, I never really had any time to do it. And, but that's when I started writing and I was blogging, um, then. And, uh, I ended up writing my first book, which was a nonfiction book, but it was connected to the practice of family law. And then, uh, it, there was a 10 year gap. <laughs> until my second book came out, which is every other weekend, which is a novel. So I, I ventured into writing fiction, but I stuck very closely with uh, the write what you know adage. And it is about a divorce and custody case. And it takes place in a neighborhood that is the neighborhood I live in, very thinly disguised. And all the characters live in the same neighborhood. Um, so the, a story is being told from multiple points of view um, by a whole circle of people that live in the same place. Yes. And I'm, I'm actually, um, somewhat amazed at the number of authors that I speak to who were either journalists, which kind of makes sense, or, um, lawyers before they started writing or as they are writing. It just seems uh -huh. to be one of those careers that kind of feeds into writing. Well, you know, lawyers, I mean, this isn't true for all lawyers. Most lawyers, uh, do spend a lot of their time writing. I mean, it's a big, certainly a big part of my job is, is writing and being able to write persuasively and clearly, uh, as an advocate. Um, and so, you know, I spend hours a day writing. It's just, it's not the same kind of writing as writing a novel, but it, it does exercise those muscles, I guess. So it's, it's not surprising to me that there are lots of lawyer, lawyer writers. Right. Yeah, it, it it does make sense. And it's um, probably nice to use your writing skills in a slightly different way, in a um, maybe maybe a little bit more creative way. A very different way. Yeah, a very different way for sure. So the book is called Every Other Weekend and you've 
you've talked a little bit about it in, in your introduction, but can you give an overview of the story itself? Well, the story is um, the story of a marriage that comes apart at the, and um, the couple have two children, two daughters uh, who are 12 and eight. And the, initially the husband who is really the protagonist, uh, although you hear definitely from the wife as well, um, is completely clueless about why his wife wants to divorce him. And the other characters in the book, besides this family, are the lawyer that the husband ends up hiring, the judge who presides over what ends up being a custody case, which just nothing starts out contentious and then some things fall apart and they end up in court about custody. There's also a girlfriend uh, that the protagonist, Jake, uh, after he and his wife separate, he has a girlfriend. Um, she's polyamorous. So there's sort of a polyamory subplot in here. Um, and then there's lots of friends and neighbors. Um, also the lawyer's daughter and husband are characters, but they're friends and neighbors who sort of comment on the activity in the book. Uh, so it's, there are these choruses where people are essentially gossiping about, oh, Jake and Lisa's marriage, their kids, their divorce. So you hear about the events in the book from multiple points of view. And as someone who grew up in a very small town, this doesn't take place. This takes place in sub, in a, a suburban area, in a larger area, not the tiny little town I grew up in, but there's very much that small town feel because everybody has an opinion. <laughs> Yeah. Well, and I, I think it's, it's a really good point is that it is like a small town and, and a neighborhood can be that way. And the neighborhood that I'm writing about, which I've lived in for most of my adult life, I, I didn't grow up in Philadelphia. This in, It's in Philadelphia, but I moved here uh, very early on. And um, it is one of those neighborhoods where you just, everybody, it's very friendly and kind of active and people all know each other. So, you know, your kids go to school with that person's kids and you go to, so you shop at the food co-op and, the, you know, the yoga studio, there's all these places that people go and it's there, there's sort of a, you know, it's sort of a progressive, politically progressive, a little bit self-satisfied community. So the book is also satirical. I mean, I'm not, it's not a heavy read or it's not meant to be. I think People have different reactions to it, depending on if they've gone through a difficult divorce. They take it, it seems like a more serious book to them. But I would say most people who read it find it on the lighter side. Um, and I will tell you that um, my favorite review that I got, uh, which is from a, a bookstagrammer, and for any of your audience who's not aware of this, there are these people on Instagram who are influencers about books. So publicists and publishers send advanced copies of books out to these wonderful readers on Instagram who then write reviews in them. And just because they got a free copy of the book doesn't mean they write a good review, <laughs> but, but they have a lot of followers. So they're good. You know, it's good for the authors to have their books reviewed. But my favorite short headline quote from one of the uh, Instagrammers, uh, bookstagrammers was if Family Court and the Real Housewives had a baby, it would be this book, which I thought was a great uh, kind of funny uh, description of it. Yeah, it's great because it it's 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 pretty accurate for the book, but it's also um it's it's something that would catch your eye. You you know, yes, you want exactly. to know more about okay, what is this book going to be about? Right, right, right. Now that you've had an introduction to both Margaret and the novel, let's go ahead and take our first break of the podcast. When we come back, we'll be talking about the initial jumping off point and the initial inspiration for the story itself. Stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. 
Are you tired of the same old news? Are you sick of the seemingly endless political spin and negativity? The GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast is a weekly news podcast covering all the top positive and uplifting news stories. We cover stories that will inspire, uplift, and remind you of the good in the world. Tune into the Golden State Media Concepts America Still Beautiful podcast to get all the great and positive news stories of today. Download the GSMC America Still Beautiful podcast on iTunes. Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast. I am speaking today with Margaret Claw about her debut novel, Every Other Weekend. Let's return to that conversation. Obviously, you can take some of your own experiences in terms of working in this arena. Um, what was your initial jumping off point for the book then? I, I had the idea of writing about a, a divorce case and in, that all takes place in my neighborhood where everybody keeps running into each other and kind of telling stories in different ways. The, an overarching theme of the book and an interest of mine is the idea that there is not necessarily one true story, that there are some things that are objective in nature, that obviously there is one true account and one account that could be a lie. And then there's lots of things that really are true to the, to the people who experience them, but experience differently by someone else. And as a lawyer who spent a lot of time in a courtroom, I've really learned the difference between those things, the objective things um, and the subjective things that are really people's experience. And I wanted to write about the subjective things. I wanted to write about some events that happen that people have different viewpoints on and they're not necessarily not you can't necessarily say that someone's lying. There is some lying in this book that's clear, but there's also some things that are not lying necessarily, but they're just different takes on events. And that was something I was really interested in exploring. Um, so that's the I, kind of the idea I had. And then, uh, you know, Sarah, I just, I really have no training in fiction, writing fiction at all. And I... I just started writing and I started writing from the point of view of the husband slash father, Jake, and some, you know, these, and it, it kind of just flowed. I just had some ideas and, you know, plot ideas and I started writing and I thought, this is great. This is going really well. And then I got to about 35 pages and I realized I was completely over my head. Like (laughs) I had no idea how to turn this into a novel. Um, because it was just a sketch, you know, and I really didn't know what to do. And so then I had to, then I sought help. Uh, I had a friend who's a novelist help me. I mean, I hired him to help me and he also helped me just as a friend, but then he helped me as an editor. Um, and, you know, and I had a lot of readers along the way who were extremely helpful. Uh, so it, it just began as this sort of concept and uh I would it but the technique of writing a novel the content I didn't have any problem with the actual making it readable and having a narrative that flows through and making it um it, just where to put the plot points kind of to create dramatic tension all of that stuff I was I had to learn it well, sure, that makes sense. It was your first nonfiction, so it makes sense that it, it would be different than the other types of writing you had already done. Um, it well, and also it, I will say I I never literally never took a creative writing class. Like I didn't. I think if I had in the course of like writing my first book, also you know studied writing more academically, or you know even been in a writers group, I think I could have probably written this faster. Because I, I kind of had to go out and get that help for myself. I mean, I don't know what made me think that, oh, because I wrote a nonfiction book, I can write a novel. Like it's a completely different thing. And, um, 
it was humbling because I, you know, I really did get stuck, but I, so it, yes, it's not surprising, but I also think a, there are a lot of people who, you know, have studied writing fiction and maybe they've written short stories or maybe they, you know, and I'm just, not, I, I hadn't. So I really started from zero. Right. And, you know, when you talk about trying to tell this story from multiple perspectives, because everyone experiences the same events in slightly different ways. Um, and so whether they are telling the truth, not telling the truth or telling their perceived version of the truth, I think this is a good way to show all of all of those different angles. Was it um, was it a challenge to write from all the different points of view? Or can you talk about that experience a little bit? No, it was not a challenge. I actually really loved writing from the different points of view. I think um, because the kind of story that this is, because it involves multiple people and events that involve, you know, different perspectives, it really kind of made sense that you'd hear from the lawyer and the judge and the lawyer's daughter and the moms in the coffee shop. And it just, it, to me, it, that part of it seemed really natural. I left out a character that um, is also uh, somewhat central to the book, even though you don't hear from him until the end, which is the dog, the family dog. Who? Um, so he is a he is a character. But uh, the multiple points of view to me was not hard. What was hard was making sure that, like when I wrote a chapter for one person's perspective, I I had to make sure that like, I didn't write something that they would be thinking about that they wouldn't actually know because they weren't at that other event. Like I had a, it, the, for, the sort of formal like um, structure. It, it seems kind of casual to have all these multiple points of view, but it's actually was complicated because I had to make sure that everybody was only talking about the things they would know or the things they'd observe. So if they were in a chapter, you know, they were, there was a meeting with someone then, okay, then they knew this thing, but if there wasn't, uh, they wouldn't. And it, so that structure became a little complicated. I've had a lot of piles of paper on my um, living room floor at certain points when I was just had like, you know, all these little short chapters spread out and I had to make sure that they all fit together. Right, because you want to make sure that the timeline is correct. Also, you yes. can't have um, one chapter taking place at this point in time, and then suddenly you're either further in the future or further in the past than the rest of the characters are. Exactly. And I have to tell you, you know, to readers who are, are writers, they will completely, like, relate to this. So initially, because it was a complicated structure with all these characters, it was completely just in chronological order. Um and then when I later worked with a developmental editor, um, an editor who helps you kind of make your book better, not like a copy editor, but um, she she had me put a scene from later in the book, which is a the opening scene of the trial that takes place in the book. She had me put that up front as the opening scene of the book. So this opens with a sort of a bang. I think it was very smart, it work, you know, work better. It's a trial scene. You don't know why these people ended up there. And then it goes back in time to a year before and works its way up to once you get to that, when the trial occurs in the timeline, then the book moves forward into the future, you know? So that, it sounds like that wouldn't be that complicated a change, but it was very complicated because then I had to change the tense of everything. (laughs) The whole first half of the book was in the past. You know, it was like, it was just, it was it technically it was difficult to do that. Um, I had to make sure, as you said, that someone didn't know something that they shouldn't have known until later, even just that one change. So um, those are the kinds of things that make writing a, a novel very, you know, technically challenging. Sure. But it also draws that reader in because you get that first scene in the trial and then you go back to kind of where it starts in terms of the divorce and you're thinking wait how did we get to that point in the trial because everything seems to be going eh, kind of okay uh yes. not to the level <laughs> that this right. book started. So, well yeah. and that that's exactly right you go back into there's this you know everyone's behaving well despite getting divorced everybody's behaving well and you know the 
this idea that you can have a very kind of amicable divorce, even if people's feelings are hurt, but people are behaving like grownups and thinking about, you know, what's best for their kids. And then something happens that goes really wrong and it gets really, can be, get really hostile really quickly. And this is completely based on, you know, cases that I've had. I mean, it just, I know that you, you, when there are kids involved, you know, you have this ongoing relationship with the other parent, which you, if you just have a divorce and there's no kids, it's really different because people can just go their separate ways. And once you have a settlement, you're done. But when you have kids, you know, you're sharing this, the main, most, you know, most important thing in your lives with each other. And it's very easy for something to happen that you disagree about. Um, and it can kind of obliterate all that sort of relative goodwill you had trying to act like grownups getting through the divorce. So that is the case that that is what happens in this book. Yes. And I think we all know people that have gone through, if not this exact experience, similar experiences where, you know, things just kind of go off the rails in ways you didn't expect. Yes. Yes. Um, It is, like we said, written from multiple points of view. Jake is the protagonist and his point of view is in the first person where no one else is told from that perspective. So can you talk a little bit more about Jake? Um, What do you think about his character might resonate with readers? What might be a challenge for readers in terms of him? Just can you talk a little bit more about his character? Sure. And I will say just at the outset that you're actually not right, but I can completely understand why. And it was a change I made late in the editing. Lisa, who is the wife, who's a much more minor character in that you don't hear from her as much. She is also written in the first person. And she was not initially, but when I worked with this editor who kind of cha- helped me change structure, she felt it was important for Lisa to be in the first person, even though there's definitely a hierarchy. It's not like a he said, she said type of story about the divorce it's much more his story but when you hear from her you are hearing from her directly because again as your readers or your listeners who are writers know when you write someone in the first person you have the reader experiences like a closer connection with that character um so um yeah so I did change her that was one of the last changes I made actually before you know it got sent out um to you know my agent sent it out um was the was lisa becoming a little bit more of a character i had her even less than she is now and also in the first person um but but, so back to your other question about jake jake is a guy who maybe thinks more of himself than he has a a sort of high opinion of himself that, that might not always be warranted but he's also like a nice guy in most circumstances and I would say he's, but he, what he is and what you find out during the book as you read it is that he's an unreliable narrator. So, um, and it's, Sarah, it's funny because I, I've done a lot of, um, and the book's been out since the end of May. So I've done a lot of book events and I've gone to a lot of book groups who've read the book. I've been going, I've done like one a week or something. I've been, and people have these really strong opinions about Jake and some people hate him. And, uh, you know, and other people think he's like, oh, he's like a good guy who just kind of like, you know, he loves his kids and, you know, like he's, oh, whatever, uh, you know, he's, it, so it's really interesting. Actually, the last book club I was at like a couple of weeks ago, I guess it was two weeks ago, um, there was a discussion. It was, it was not like people who knew each other. It wasn't one of those types of book groups. It was a, at a, um, at a, a club that has like a, like a social club kind of that has a book group. So members come, but they don't all know each other. So uh they read the book and they come and uh this, there was a discussion about Jake and some, this one woman was saying how much she like couldn't stand him. And he was like, so awful. And this, these other people were going, what's so bad about him? And she was like, I know that man, I dated him. <laughs> so it was very funny. Like, you know, she just, couldn't had a very visceral reaction yeah, against yeah. him, but yeah. I did not intend that. I was surprised, have been surprised that people find him to be like a terrible character. I mean, most people don't, but there are people who have very strong opinions about him. I meant him to be sort of likable, clueless, and some of the things about men that women are, you know, find annoying. 
I'm making gross generalizations here, but I kind of gave him some of those qualities. Um, but I thought he, I thought for the most part, you would pretty much like him and kind of root for him. But I have found out that that's not always the case. Well, he is for the most part likable, but he does have those moments where you just want to flick him in the forehead because you make him like you're an idiot. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. On that note of me wanting to flick a main character in the forehead. (laughs) I have that reaction a lot in books. There's just certain characters that you're like, seriously, come on, pull it together. But uh, we're going to talk more about Jake, so keep this conversation in mind. In the meantime, you are listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I'll be right back. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and my conversation with Margaret Claw. As you remember, before the break, we were talking about the protagonist, Jake, who is a charming character. He's got some fun qualities about him, but at the same time, I said I kind of wanted to flick him in the forehead sometimes, and she said, yeah, you're being an idiot. So I just wanted to remind you of that conversation because that's going to make my comment going forward make a little bit more sense, just in case you'd forgotten where we left off. Let's continue with the interview. At the same time, he's also not one-dimensional. You know, humans are not one-dimensional. So when you can present a character that brings out that many different emotions in readers, they, you've clearly done something right. Well, I appreciate that. And I I definitely agree that, you know, people aren't one dimensional. And I think that goes to the sort of idea of people experience things differently, that these, the characters are meant to all have like, they all have sort of moral dilemmas in, in the book that they face about what they say, what they do. Um, and I just think that that is the way that we all live. And it's specifically with Jake, there are some things in the book that he, you find out by the end that he has, that he does lie about. And then there's also like a sort of important event that happens where you hear about it from his perspective and from the other character's perspective who's involved. And there is no resolution as to quote, what happened. Like you hear about it in different ways. And I just think, and a lot of people have asked me about that incident, like what really happened? And I honestly, I've always, I've said, I don't know. I don't have an opinion. Like I really was trying to write a scene where one person would think one thing happened or tell themselves a story about what what happened. The other would think the other. And, you know, that when people, and one of the characters tells it to different groups of people and she tells it different ways. And I think that's very realistic too. She's a teenage girl. So she's telling a story to her mother differently than she tells it to her friends. And I know teenage girls and, uh, and I'm sure that's true with boys too. I just didn't raise any of those. Um, But, and I never was one of those, but I think, I think this, though, those issues are, you know, very, um, I just think it's realistic that there's, moral and factual ambiguity in all our lives. So I really was trying to, you know, play with that. Well, I think that's a good point. And I think it's also a good, um, it's a good thing that you brought in, like the, the judge who is presiding over this case has a few chapters from her point of view and her perspective. And she has to take 
all of these different stories that she's hearing from all of the different parties and how they're being filtered through experience or not quite truthfulness. And she has to figure out what's the best solution for this family. And that I can only imagine is incredibly difficult. Yes. And, and one of the things that I put in the book that I didn't really think twice about, but a lot of people have asked me about it. Is this really true? Um, is I put, I have scenes where the judge is talking to her staff about the case and, um, and getting input from her law clerk about the case. And people have asked me, does that really happen? And I, I, you know, like I said, it didn't even occur to me that that was something of, of particular that would be surprising, like an inside knowledge. But of course it is inside knowledge because how would you know that? And yes, they do all the time. And, and, you know, when parties leave the courtroom, if the lawyers are just there, then the the court staff just starts talking about everybody. Like, you know, it's definitely, the court is like a theater um, and everyone has their role and they're, you know, it's very prescribed. And then when the, when they're off stage or they're backstage, it's just like backstage at a play, you know, they're, they're gossiping and talking and critiquing, you know, what somebody wore. Like it, it's, that's all very realistic. And I, it is interesting because I've been doing this for so long. I didn't really think about that as like an inside look that would, that people would really like, but a lot of people have mentioned that to me. They like the scenes, the courtroom scenes where the staff are talking, um, which is interesting. I think it's a little, it's more realistic than some of the scenes that you see on television that are made oh for kind God. of drama. It's yes. Much more, <laughs> sorry yes. for me to trigger you. Uh, this felt much more um, real and, and I don't want to say normal, but I guess real would be the best word. Well, it's just like everybody's, you have a role, you have a role, if, you know, you're a lawyer, you have a role if you're a judge, you have, you know, and, but you are also just a person. And so you know, you play that role, but you also need to, you know, you, you you talk about what's going on and you have to use your own experience to make decisions. And so it is realistic. Yeah. I have to tell you um, uh, one quick anecdote. When one of my daughters was like in the summer, she, she, I think she was 14 or was like 14. Yeah. And she was sort of, in, she had nothing to do. She was like in between things she was doing that summer. And she'd always ask me if she could go to court with me because she was interested in what I did. And I always said, no, like you can't, I would be weird. I'm not going to have a client, like have my, have my kid tag along, you know, it would be disrespectful to the client. So, uh, and there's a confidentiality issue. So no, you can't, but I had this idea that maybe she could sit in, uh, with a judge for a day and hear like a custody list, which is kind of the most interesting cases from, you know, would be for her because other, so a custody list, a day where multiple custody cases are being heard. Um, and she said she wanted to do that. And so I arranged it with a judge that I was friendly with and she, my daughter sat in for the day and then I picked her up at the end of the day and she loved it. It was so interesting. And she said, mom, did you know that when the lawyers leave the room, they all talk about them? <laughs> and I was like, it's like, actually, I don't know that because by definition, like I'm not in the room when that happens, but I'm totally not surprised. But it actually, I remember thinking that I know they talk about the litigants. They talk about the parties, but I, of course, they also would talk about the lawyers once the lawyers leave. So that was a, a revelation to me that was, should have been obvious, but it was funny that she, uh, <laughs> I say, you learn something I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I love how she, mom. <laughs> she's mom, did you know? <laughs> um, obviously, you have been able to use a lot of your own experience and um, knowledge for the writing of this book, but were there any particular areas that you needed to research? The one area that I felt like I really needed to do research because I didn't want to make any mistakes about it was about polyamory, which I do know about and I know people who are polyamorous. Um, but there is a, you know, there's a philosophy underpinning it and there's a sort of, you know, I know there's some competing philosophies, but the, the idea of not being monogamous and having multiple relationships and being okay with that and how you work that out and everything. I did read a lot about that. So I read, you know, I read like some, I don't know, not really treatises, but I read different things on polyamory. 
there's like the American Polyamory Society. Uh, you know, I, I just want to make sure that my polyamorous characters weren't saying anything that wouldn't ring true to someone who was polyamorous because everything else I know so well, I stayed so close to like my own life and my own clients and, you know, my own experience. And that is not part of my personal experience. I just wanted to, I don't want to make a mistake. So, um, but people have read it who were polyamorous and said they, it was, you know, it was a good portrayal of that. So um, that was the only thing I really had to research. Which is good. And you don't want to, it's very easy sometimes, I think, to portray people who have, you know, a lifestyle or belief system that isn't necessarily the author's. You can, it's easy to do that very one dimensionally or, you know, kind of stereotypically in some ways you you want to present yes. them as full characters well i think we've all had the experience of reading a book where there is a character that you know you know something about what that character does or where they live or something like that and you read something that the author writes and it's not accurate and it, i think it takes you it takes you out of the book it's like oh well that's not right you know <laughs> The, so I mean, like you're talking about law shows. I mean, it's very hard to like get involved in a show or a book about law when things happen that are totally unrealistic. Um, so I, I do think I'm like terrified of, get, I was terrified of getting anything wrong like that in the book. And I really, that's why I really did this sort of deep dive into reading about polyamory because I felt it's the one area where I might screw up because I'm right. very sensitive to that. And I definitely had that experience where I, Someone writes something, I, they toss it off, you know, and it's wrong. Uh, I'm I'm from Montana, and it just absolutely drives me batty when I read books that are set in Montana. You can tell the author's never been there. Like you know, <laughs> that's a perfect example. That's a perfect example. Oh, yeah, no, and the, and I I don't know, like these writers who are very like like Jody Pacall, like who she she's so good at these totally different settings, totally different. Um, you know, things that she's writing about. And it seems like she really does get it all right. And she, I know she's a mad researcher and she, um, but it's, it, I admire that so much. Yeah. I, and I know you can't get everything right, especially when someone grew up in the place that you're writing about. So, you know, you kind of have to find that balance, but um, in terms of your character development, obviously there's, many different characters and lots of them have their own voice and perspective. When you set out to write the book, did you have really good understandings of those characters or did you let them evolve as the book was written or was it a combination thereof? I think I kind of left, I mean, I knew who the main characters were going to be, um, but not, there's some characters I added as it went along. Um uh, and even after the first draft, I kind of added a character. Um, but I, um, I just, it's hard, it's hard for me to answer. Like I, it, it I feel like the first, you know, as I started writing, it was so undeveloped that it, it wasn't like a, like I wrote a whole draft of the novel and then I went back and revised. It was kind of a, I, I worked on things. It, you know, in a, di- in a way that was not linear. So, um, but I, o- I always knew I was going to have a lot of, you know, I have all these characters. Um, but, you know, I, I changed some characters. I made some characters more in depth. Uh, I mean, I'll give you an interesting example, which is that when I worked with the developmental editor who really whipped the book into shape for help me, you know, she, I mean, she didn't write anything. She just told me that stuff she thought I should do to make it better. One of the things that she said was, so so I have this dog, Pinky the dog, who's in the book, and you don't actually hear from him until you hear his point of view at the end. But throughout, you know, he's like going back and forth to both households, and he's a character that everybody kind of talks, the parents and the kids talk about. Um, And he was... I had chapters in his voice. They were very short, but and there but there weren't a lot of them, but they were sp- interspersed throughout the book. You actually heard from him. And the editor said to me, "You you should lose those. Ch- ch- you have too there's too much pinky. It's a little corny. But the younger daughter, Ch- Charlie is her name. You need to beef up her character because you're using them to." to perform the same function. Like they, they're the voice of what happens in both mom's house and dad's house. Cause the kids go back and forth and the dog went back and forth. So I was using the dog to kind of 
tell tell tales out of school about what's going on, you know, and and she said, develop the little girl more because she's a really good character and you don't have that much of her. Make her a bigger character and uh, cut back on the dog. And that was like, that's the sort of thing that you have no perspective on as a writer and to have someone who's ha- looking at it from like 30,000 feet and is really experienced, you know, working with authors. It was great because I, I just got it when she said it, like, that's right. That makes total <laughs> sense. And I just did it. You know, and it, it did make it, it made it a better book. And she became a really, I think a really a good character. Like I, she was just kind of un, a little unformed before she became much more of a real eight-year-old. Well, and she's important to the story because she is unintentionally the catalyst for certain events taking place. Yes. And she yeah. was always that, but you just didn't, she was kind of on her, you just didn't hear much from her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is your first um, fiction novel. Will you write more, do you think? Yeah, I do want, I want to, and I have a, I have an idea for, a, for an, another novel and it's, I am going to venture outside of the realm of family law since I've now written a nonfiction book and a fiction and a novel involving what I, what I do. The first one was sort of more in the memoir category. Um, I'm going to try to write, <laughs> try to write about something that is not about f- family law. However, it is going to involve a courtroom. There'll be a courtroom drama in it. And because I think that's something I know I can write about that convincingly. And I think I know people like that. And, um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, a. I ha- I'm, I have an idea and I have a rough, very rough outline of the plot. And, um, I, yeah, so I'm going to, my, it's my new year's, it will be my new year's resolution to start, get started on that because this, the publicity for this book is kind of, winding down and you know I do have a job and stuff so it's like it's a lot um when you're out there doing all these events and I mean it's great and um I like doing it but I haven't felt like I could start writing something else but I'm I'm feeling like January I can that's my goal makes sense it is time now for our final break of this episode when we come back Margaret will be talking about deciding to write for publication, as well as some of her advice for aspiring authors. So stay tuned. You're listening to the GSMC Book Review Podcast, and I will be right back. Pets bring such joy to our lives, and the GSMC Pets Podcast is here to share in that joy. We'll tell stories of pets finding their forever homes, acting in unexpected ways, being helpful, or just being silly. Whether you love dogs, cats, llamas, reptiles, fish, or you've never met an animal you didn't like, the GSMC Pets Podcast is for you. Welcome back to the GSMC Book Review Podcast and the conclusion of my interview with Margaret Claw. You obviously write in your career. You've mentioned that. Um, there's a lot of writing and then the nonfiction and then the fiction. What do you think was the um, that impetus that made you say, you know what, I would like to write something for publication if possible? It came from the, the first book happened because I started writing a blog and it was about, I had always thought what I did for work was interesting. What all of us who you know, practice in this area was interesting and you could tell some great stories. And I, I started writing this blog that was like little vignettes, kind of day in the life of a family lawyer, you know, an, an interesting interaction in court or an interesting case that not, le- it wasn't legal. It wasn't for a legal audience. It was just, it was impressionistic. It was for anybody who might be interested. And it was called Family Law Unraveled. And then I ended up getting it. Um, the Huffington Post started, t- took it because those days you could, they don't have this system anymore, but the Huffington Post would publish 
you could be a blogger for the Huffington Post and you weren't like on their staff. You were just, you, you, they would accept you as a blogger and then they would publish your blog. And so I started regularly writing for the Huffington Post. And then I got a lot of readers on the blog. Um, it wasn't called Family Law Unraveled. It was the Huffington Post. It was just, you know, um, but, um, I started getting a lot of readers and a friend of mine who's a writer, uh, as in professional, like she's a, investigative journalist and she's written several books and she really liked the blog and she said to me you know you could turn this into a book and I said well I really hadn't even thought of that and I said I how would you even do that like how would I turn this into a book and she said I will help you write a book proposal because with nonfiction, you don't have to write a whole book before you necessarily you know get it if you can get a, a contract for the book it's often based on a proposal that has like, you know, sample chapters and then an outline and then a whole marketing plan for the book. Like it's a really different thing than a novel. So no one wants, no one will read half a novel, but I mean, unless you're anyway, no one will do that. You have to, but with nonfiction, you could do a book proposal. So she helped me do this book proposal and I ended up getting a publisher with no agent. I just, I was just lucky, extremely lucky. It was the uh, total opposite experience as with the novel where I spent like three years trying to get a publisher for it. I mean, I, I re in between rewrites, like I redid a rewritten version of it and re resubmitted it. And that was with an agent. So it was, I, I had this very lucky experience the first time. And I also think that's part of why I thought, oh, well, I'll write a novel. I got this first book published. I got an advance. I like, you know. <laughs> I had this kind of fairy tale experience with the first book and then I, the brutally complicated experience with the novel. Um, but that's what happened. It was because of the blog and this, it was really because of my friend saying, Hey, you can make this into a book. Which is very cool. And yeah. you, you, you've written nonfiction and fiction. Um, so from your experience in both worlds, do you have advice for aspiring authors? Well, I think fiction is harder. Um, I think it's a lot harder. I mean, if you already are a, a comfortable writer, writing nonfiction is kind of an extension of what you might write in, like, if you do anything for work or you, you know, you have to write clearly, you have to capture people's attention. Um, not that it's not hard to write a nonfiction book, but I just think it's really different than writing a novel. So I, I, I think my advice would be that just if you're going to write fiction, get as much help as possible. Like get, have a lot of readers all throughout because you have no perspective on it. Um, I had a book group, a book group that had read my first book and I went and spoke to them. They were actually a book group that the bookkeeper at my law firm is in and has been in for a long time. And, and I really liked these women. They were really great readers and they'd been, you know, they were just real readers. And I had the idea with the novel to see if they'd be interested in reading my like first sort of polished, but still basically first draft in manuscript form and giving me feedback on it, like a workshop, like workshop the book with this book group. And they were really interested in doing that. And they did that. And it was like super helpful because I had, you know, 15 women who read like a book a week and they read fiction. That's what they're really not a book group that reads nonfiction. And they had so many good comments and there was a lot of stuff they agreed on. So it was like a lot of people said the same thing, you know, you should do this needs to be more or whatever. And so I just think don't be afraid of getting input from readers. Don't hide it in your on your computer and not send it, you know, and then try to get an agent for it. Like have people read and give you feedback because you want it to be, uh, you want people to buy it. So you have to see how it plays with, you know, with uh, people who would read such a book. Yeah. So that makes, I think was, I, I did, a, I, that was very helpful to me. Makes absolute sense. When you take time to read for yourself, and that might need might, might not be a lot of time since you've got a lot on your plate. Um, but when you take time to read just for you, do you have favorite authors and genres? Well, I mostly read fiction, I would say. Um, and 
Oh, well, one of my favorite books that I recently read that probably many, many people listening to who would listen to this podcast or, or in your audience in general um, have read, which is um, Demon Copperhead. I love Barbara Kingsolver. Um, I'm still kind of blown away by that book. Um, I'm currently reading a memoir, which I don't actually love memoir, and um, but this is um, was recommended to me. Uh, it's called Exit Interview. It's um, Christy Coulter is the author, and it's a it's a memoir about her time working at Amazon. And um, it's, it's funny and it's pretty interesting. Um, but yeah, that, that's not generally what I read. Um, I, I generally, I, I, I read fiction and I tend to read women authors. Um, and, uh, you know, I just, I'm trying to always be reading something. Yeah. I, I also love Barbara King Solver. Her books just kind of tear you apart in the best ways. Oh my uh, gosh. I- you are the second person today that has mentioned that particular book. So it's definitely <laughs> time to up, put that further up on my TBR. <laughs> well, it's very, it's daunting because it's very long and it is like, you know, it is a modern version of David Copperfield, which I never read. Now I want to go and read it. Um, but it is, so it is long. It's a, it's a, it's a hefty book. Um, and it's a little intimidating. I was a little intimidated when I got it because it, you know, I got, it's, I got the hard back. It weighs a lot. <laughs> you know, it's like 700 pages, but hard, man, hard to read in the tub when they're like that. Yeah. Hard to read in the tub. Yeah. But I couldn't put it down, but it took me a long time to read. Sure. Yeah. Makes absolute sense. Um, if people would like to know more about you and uh, this book and your memoir, uh, do you, can you share any social media that you are active on and uh, a website if you have one? Sure. My, I mean, my website is easy because it's margaretclaw.com, claw with K-L-A-W. Um, and that has all my other writing on it. It, it, all the, like what I was talking about, the, blogging for Huff Post and then articles I've written for other magazines and publications. Um, and also has my first book, uh, which you can buy, which is, you know, it's interesting because it came out 10 years ago, but there have been, um, you know, so people have bought it because of reading, because of the new book, not that many, but it, you know, it kind of was been dormant for quite a while now, but it's called keeping it civil. Um, and that there's links and, and my book, can, and that book can be bought anywhere. I mean, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, local bookstores. Um, I mean, a, a small local bookstore might not have, have these books. They might have to order them for you, but bookshop.org, um, anywhere online you can get books, you can get th- these books, but I would say, so that's my website. Um, I'm on, man, I, it, my, it, my social media is my name, Margaret Claw. So it's like I have Instagram and, um, mm. Facebook, but. I'm trying to be active on Instagram. I tried to really learn how to use Instagram and I've enjoyed it. Um, I don't know. Do a lot of your authors talk about Instagram, Sarah? More. Yeah. That one seems to be more common um, than I, I would actually say that's probably the most common. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, because there are all of these like book reviewers and people like talk about books on Instagram. It's a great place to sort of promote your book. Um but I also started using it more kind of I, in addition to promoting the book, just using it for personal stuff, which I think you have to, if you're going to post a lot, you have to mix in. You can't just post stuff promoting yourself. So it has to be personal also. Um, right. But, yeah, yeah. Helps if but, you have a cute dog. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. But I would say, I mean, the best place to go for really to is my website just because there's lots of stuff on there. There's also a really fun book trailer that I did with friends that's on the website. Um, that is for, for, um, every other weekend. And there is a, do- there is a dog who shows up, uh, Pinky the dog, uh, based on the dog in the book. We was my website designer's dog. She, she showed up when we were shooting this video with her dog and he makes a cameo. <laughs> so it, it's a fun, nice. it's just a short, you know, one minute trailer for the book. Mm-hmm. Love it. Well, Margaret, we've talked about a few different things during this time, but is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to make sure you highlighted? I don't think so. I think this is it. And I appreciate, uh, I appreciate the time and um, hopefully there are readers out there who are listening who would and will enjoy the book. 
Yeah, and I uh, appreciate your time as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about the book and your writing. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you once again to Margaret for joining me to discuss this book and writing, etc. Really appreciate it, as always. If you are a fan of stories told from multiple points of view, if you are interested in a story that might teach you more about family court, or you are interested in stories that... Um, it might be not quite what you're expecting in terms of being told from multiple points of view, then you definitely want to check out this novel. And, uh, you know, holidays are coming. There's gift op- gift buying opportunities galore. So maybe someone you know would like to read this book and it would make a great present or stocking stuffer. You know me, books for any occasion <laughs> make great presents. I'm always peddling the books. So you should definitely check this out. Uh, you can, as Margaret said, buy it pretty much anywhere and um, share it with a friend. Read it for your book group, whatever. Um, definitely some good possibilities there. So uh, it's very well written. It's like I said at the beginning, lots of different angles and layers and levels to the story because it is told from so many different points of view. So you're really getting a very interesting rounded picture of a story where you may sometimes just get a story from one or two points of view. Thank you again to Margaret. Thank you, of course, as always to you, my listeners, for joining me. You know what? I did not mention at the beginning of this podcast uh, that Last week, we had a Thanksgiving episode. Um, I had mentioned that we were going to have co-authors. Um, Detina and our Gita Zali were going to be on the podcast. They unfortunately had to reschedule, so I'll be speaking with them in a couple of weeks. In case you were wondering where the heck did that episode go, it uh, has not gone away. It has just been postponed a little bit. So still looking forward to speaking with them in just a couple weeks. I hope you'll join me next week when I will be speaking. We're, we're doing a children's book, which you know I always love. I'll be speaking with author Diana Bohm about her children's book. I think it's a series of children's book, but I uh, could be incorrect about that. That's what's sticking in my brain right now. So join me for that interview. And in the meantime, I hope you're having a great week. As part of that week, if you are so inclined and would like to help the podcast reach more listeners such as your delightfully wonderful selves, you can, of course, like, follow, subscribe on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on to make sure you're always getting new episodes. But also on those platforms, you can leave comments or leave reviews, and those are very helpful. That review can be one, it can be starred, it can be written, it can be one sentence just whatever you have it in you to share is wonderful and I appreciate it. You can also follow the podcast on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Find the posts, hit me up in the comments, let me know what you're reading, what you want to read. Did you hit your reading goals for 2023? All those wonderful things. Do you have reading goals for 2024? Yeah, just come tell me everything. You know, I love to hear it. Hope you're doing great. I hope you, as I said, having a wonderful week. Maybe you're recovering from uh, eating too much turkey. Maybe you are having a great week because you got a long weekend. Whatever the case may be, I hope it's great. And I hope that it is affording you plenty of time to find yourself lost in a lot of great books. Thank you so much. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Book Review Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.